Hey. Brian, are you going to introduce us? <laughs> yes, he is. Or he's not. All right, not sure. Uh, by popular viewer demand, <laughs> I am now microphoned. Uh, so we are now live with episode 20 of the Dr. Hughes Show. And now the star of our show, Dr. Hugh. Well, welcome back. Glad you could join us for the Carburation Clinic this week. We weren't on last week because of you know why. It's been a wild ride. We are, uh, of course, you, as you can realize, we would be slammed to the walls, and we are. So we still want to take an opportunity to stop and uh, help anyone who needs answers to their questions about um, fuel hookup or generator sizing or any of the questions related to al alternative fuel and um, generators or any other carburation question that we can answer. So that's mainly why we're here. We didn't really put together a format of uh, any kind of uh, entertainment value. Uh, other than our, our normal inability to have a smooth show. But that's what kind of makes it fun. We, we could script it, which uh, if someone would like to volunteer to do that, you know, in Hollywood, we'd be glad to have you. But anyway. Dr. Uh, Hugh, we got our first question. Okay. I realize now that I have a microphone, I don't have to get your attention. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this question just, comes. Just break in, you know, like you normally do. This question comes from YouTube. This is from Michael. Michael says, can a 21 foot half inch hose from a three quarter or one inch supply from the house be enough to run a generator, which is 7,500 or 6,500 watts? <clears throat> okay, you're talking about natural gas. Uh, our charts are on the website. I don't know exactly what the chart says about that, but here's the thing about Natural gas pipe sizing and sizing charts are, are based on our load. In other words, it's as if you turn on everything. Boy, I like when you do that. It's pretty cool. Uh, I, I got to see it, though. All right, let me see. So he said 20, how many feet? 20, 21 feet, half inch. Okay. Uh, 20 feet, half inch hose, and he wants to run a what? 7,500. All right, see, that chart shows, uh, we would normally tell customers, well, 12 horse, okay? Now, that, uh, you got to remember when we started, we started this offering accessories to customers 25 years ago, there was nothing to go to. We had to invent our own charts for customers. We were the first ones to do that. And so, using all the math we could figure, all the uh, time and service, testing, whatever, we came up with these charts to help people pick the right size hose that they wouldn't have an issue with. And for 25 years, we've, we've not had a, a single issue where someone says that, that the chart was off. <clears throat> so that's led me to believe that the charts are probably a little, um, what's the term I always use, uh, conservative. Uh, when it comes to gas supply, you have your, your gas meter with a regulator on it, supplying pressure to the pipe size, it drops, it drops, drops, goes to different appliances. It's just like a, a gas and water, basically the same. Uh, the charts are set up just like in your home. If you have two bathrooms, two showers, uh, hose bib outside, washer, they're designed so when you turn everything on, there's not going to be pressure drops at all the appliances. So having said that, if, um, if you run just a generator and a few other electrical appliances you're not going to be consuming the gas at let's say your your stove that's a, that's a biggie if you have a gas stove 
that's 75,000 BTU and you're not even running it. That's not even part of the equation anymore because it's not even being used. So I know I'm beating around the bush and it's very hard not to because uh, <laughs> you can get in trouble that way. However, uh, I would not be surprised at all if it would work fine because um, that's saying you're going to be running that generator at full load for a full hour. And typically generators use 50% of their load. So if you use that equation, uh, you're down below what, what that would use. So uh, the chart says to use three quarter because when you go to three quarter, what does it say? Uh, yeah, it'll run a 25 horse. Yeah, that's, see how you're in that window between uh, half to three quarter being from 12 horse to 25? Uh, it could be very well that you know, the half will be fine. And I've had customers do it and not have problems, but we, we've, been, we've been using the charts for 25 years, they've been working. We can't really go beyond them. However, it seems like uh, customers who have done that, they work fine. Boy, I hope that answers that. <laughs> do you think it answered it, Brian? I do, I'm gonna put the chart back up and I'm also just gonna call uh, the viewers' attention that there's a URL there on the chart. Study it at your own pace. So there it is. All right. Yeah, there's a process when it comes to uh, sizing up gas lines, but um, that chart is basically off the meter. So, uh, but there can be other factors. As I mentioned one time, I had had to go down to Miami to help out some people because. They had one inch gas lines to their generators, their two barrel carburetors, but none of them ran properly. And tried troubleshooting on the phone, couldn't get it done, nothing seemed to work. So they flew me down there. I was there five minutes and found the problem. They had run, definitely run their half inch line, it was all great, ran over towards the garage, stubbed up and tied into a half inch gas line that fed a water heater off the main line. So. You know, you just can't ramp up on natural gas. It just doesn't work like that. There's no such thing as a bell increaser. You know, that should be a famous quote. There is no such thing as a bell increaser, only a bell reducer when it comes to gas. You can use a bell increaser actually for storage, but uh, it doesn't work under load. For all yeah, the, we're just looking for some more questions. <laughs> uh, for all the insomniacs out there, it's a good time to right, <laughs> fall asleep. <laughs> ah, Dr. Hugh. Mm. I was going to take up juggling, but they say when the ball is at the top is when you throw the next one. and that's I just still can't get that down. That's... Uh, Dr. Hugh, if we're waiting for another question, we'll give it a few more minutes, and if there are no more questions, we'll, we'll sign off. We'll but say bye-bye. Maybe you could demonstrate with the uh, demo regulator that you have there. The, uh, we had some customers during, the, uh, during all the uh, tech support calls of the hurricanes of the past several weeks um, still just uh, refuse to believe that the, the newness of the tank can be a problem and blaming the regulator and maybe you could demonstrate a little bit about how the regulator works you know to put people's minds at ease there if they're, if they're experiencing that yeah i'm glad you brought that up and we've even had customers say you know dr hughes says these regulators are basically bulletproof well yes they really are uh, and um um uh, what I wanted to do was a show where I was going to bring in a 20 pound cylinder that was not purged correctly, hook it to a burner and show how it will work perfectly on the burner. Uh, and we have, we have everything, we just haven't gotten to, the, to doing the because of the hurricanes. Kept priming it and priming it and priming it. And, uh, and that, all that does is flood it, but 
Um, so yeah, yeah. If the the problem he was having is, see when you when you prime the regulator, here's the here's a primer button on the back. What, what happens is when negative pressure from the carburetor goes into this chamber, the pressure inside this chamber is reduced. So it causes this area to be lower in pressure than this side of the diaphragm. This is on the atmospheric side. So what happens is the atmosphere over here on the opposite side presses in just like I'm doing with the primer. So the primer, you can almost act like atmospheric pressure. So <clears throat> you're, you're cranking the engine. There's a negative signal right here in this chamber. The atmosphere is now pushing on the diaphragm and you see how the lever moves and the little seat comes off the orifice and gas flows. Well, the main thing about this, if you do have a properly purged cylinder, is whatever you do, do not over prime a regulator because you'll instantly flood an engine. With alternative fuel, you can flood an engine in no time. So we always suggest just little, little bursts of prime to start with. And so when it comes, the, the, the rule of thumb is if you can smell propane or natural gas, then it's flooded. If that happens, turn off the fuel supply uh, as close to the regulator as possible. Try cranking the engine, pulling or electrically, however it is, and then you should hear it hit. That means, okay, it's purged out excessive gas. Then the best thing to do is, while you're cranking it, turn on the fuel. And that's what's great about electric starts. So let's, let's, do, let's walk that through. We think it's flooded, we turn off the gas, we crank it, and then we hear it hit. Boom, all right, now we're ready. We start cranking again, and then we turn on the fuel as we're cranking. If it doesn't try to start at that moment, then you just tap the primer a little bit. And now it'll start to run and you can keep tapping, but while you're tapping, you adjust the load block in or out prep and out is not always the best solution, but uh, that's where you get your balance for, for setting the mixture. So uh, just remember these things will flood very easy because they're, they're a gas vapor. So, but please those, They'll show me pictures all the time because we ask for fuel in, fuel out. And when we see the tanks, we, we can normally tell that they're a brand new tank. And it, it just wastes your time. I mean, if you have spark and you have air because you're breathing and you have the proper fuel, it has to go boom. Now, the engine may not run properly. I had one the other day. It was a Tecumseh, old Tecumseh. I believe it was HM100, it probably would not run on propane. The customer's having a problem with it running on propane, but in that case, most likely it was a mechanical issue. It could not, uh, could not, did not have the compression necessary to have proper combustion with propane. On gasoline, it could just get by, but on propane, it couldn't do it. But the most common is it'll get, it'll do fine on gasoline do fine on propane, but won't run on natural. Again, that, that has a, a bearing on the quality uh, of the, uh, the engine itself. And so you can either try adjusting the valves, get better compression, try going to a little tighter spark gap, which of course we recommend about 20 thousandths, and that's of an inch. So the number is 0 0.020. That gives you a hotter spark because so it takes a little hotter charge to ignite alternative fuel especially uh, if you got low pro low btu natural gas uh, the insomniacs are loving this they're like oh man he can put me to sleep any more questions there yeah we do have a couple more questions huh. actually we've got uh, this is in from youtube this is hardwire 12 
Hardwire says, how well do propane generators work with natural gas conversion kits? Any suggestions for that type of setup? So I'm assuming we're talking about a generator that's off the shelf with uh, propane gasoline uh, operation. Okay. Yes, we've, uh, from what I gather, uh, we've been providing customers with snorkel kits. Uh, setups for those systems without issue. Uh, I've I've not heard anything negative about that of you, because they've asked me, is it? Can we just provide the the standard kit? And my answer is, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and so, but it does take the snorkel accessory. You just can't uh, you can't do it any other way, from what we found so far. Okay, so, we got yeah. another question here. This is from Donald. Donald says, how does motor snorkel compare to a traditional metal input attachment? If space wasn't an issue, are you better off with the metal one? <clears throat> the answer is no. Uh, you got to remember that what's, what's revolutionary about the motor snorkel is that the, the probe in the snorkel goes to the Venturi area of the original gasoline carburetor on the machine okay venturi and we know a venturi is a constriction all right well with adapter kits you're adding a second venturi and a second constriction so you're affecting airflow and air volume uh, so and it's funny we've had people that have gotten these and, and are disappointed it's kind of like you know, I wanted a big box and a big thing to stick on there, and metal's got to be better. But, you know, when it's so simplistic like this and performs better, that's, I mean, like I said, we got the patent in 2013, and this is 98% of all our sales because it's just so fabulous to put on, so easy. Uh, it's right at the OEM uh, Venturi area so it gets the best signal uh, so no uh, even if it does even if the uh, the load block I mean the uh, adapter does fit they're inch and a quarter thick so you have to add stud extenders I had a, a set here of everything but you have to add stud extenders to the carburetor you have to cut the crankcase vent tube that goes to the air filter and add a piece to to extend it out um, it blocks almost every adapter blocks the gasoline vent hole on the carburetor and I should be able to show you that can I go in on the camera Brian yep. all right see on, like on this carburetor here uh, this is the gasoline bowl vent see and so that chamber if you follow it runs down to the bowl so because when you know, as, as gasoline is coming and going, air is moving in and out. Well, when you put a solid, oh, here, here's an adapter. When you put a solid adapter on there, you see, you're going to block that hole. And so, I'm just trying to show you, all right? So you're blocking any of the passages that have been engineered for this carburetor. See, see that? Hey, we got UPS, all right? Now with the motor snorkel, as you can see, you don't have, here. here's a little cut in the, the gasket, which of course matches the OEM. And look at that. All the holes are available for running on gasoline. So no blockage. And of course, with the, with the hard type chokes, you can still choke it and run it on uh, propane or natural gas. So yeah, even if you could fit the adapter in, you're, you're just better off with the snorkel. Was, was that the full question? Did I get, sometimes I can't remember the full question. Okay. Uh, all right, Dr. Hugh, we definitely do have some more questions. Uh, looks like they're coming in from Facebook. Just a couple of, uh, interesting these are more comments than questions but uh, there's a fellow michael over on youtube said he wants a u.s carb sticker so we're going to take care of him if he wants a u.s carb uh, sticker <laughs> that's not even a sticker <laughs> there is a uh 
How come I'm not live? I'm on a delay. Why am I on a delay? Oh, there it is. There <laughs> it's not even a sticker. Yeah. Yeah, we could. Hey, we do. We could send him a sticker. Yep. So we also uh, have some more comments. Grant says he loves the kit on his generator. Hey, like that. And we got a question from Jim, which I answered in the comments. Jim says, can I use your kits to run on natural gas? So you might just take a minute, Dr. Hugh, and talk about what is a tri-fuel kit? I mean, what just maybe give us the, the real high level. What are we doing here with motorcycle? <laughs> well... Uh Well, you always put me on the spot. All right, so this this engine regulator is has been engineered to accept a certain BTU content of vapor pressure coming in. Orifice, and this they're they're actually adjustable, but we use a seven sixteenths. Uh, the way it's calibrated. This will handle most any engine. We, we use these on the little 1,000 Yamahas, and they will idle. I have to show that one day. I, I, first time that happened, when I put a snorkel on a 1,000 at Yamaha, I said, hey, let's pull a throttle down to idle, see what happens. And it just, it was just so sweet. There's something like, it's just like that military, we have a military unit up front we need to bring down and, and put on the show. You need to hear it. And you probably can't enjoy it as much as you would if you were alive but the, the sound of that machine uh, is just fabulous uh, but anyway uh, it's calibrated to accept uh, like I said a certain BTU fuels and about <laughs> I see that uh, you know like 800 uh, BTU per cubic foot I think is as low as you could probably go but it could probably go as high as 2,500 BTU per cubic foot, even higher maybe. Uh, don't, don't lock me in on that. I haven't thought about that for a long time. But within that realm, once you're in that range, then the calibrator, which, as you can see, is missing from here, because <laughs> I think every piece in this building has been ravaged for the storms that have come through. Uh, we're getting in stuff every day, just... Uh, our suppliers can't keep up with us. But uh, this would calibrate the BTU content of the fuel with the elevation, engine size, and so forth. And so that, that brings up another question. Customers will say, we just had it not long ago. Uh, and I didn't really, I didn't dig into the question, but the customer called one of my CSRs and said, I have 65% methane in a, a well or something. Can I, can I use that to run an engine? I don't know exactly what that means, 65% methane. Does that mean 65% of the cave is full of methane? I don't understand. But I, I told the CSR to see if the gentleman could tell you how much BTU he has per cubic foot or if it's even under pressure. I mean, I, I, I just didn't dig into it deep enough because we really don't support that because it's, it's out of our realm of... Um, customer service and to try to help people understand that uh, we we were so busy with just you know standard all, propane natural gas to to delve into those other fuels is, is difficult just like gases you get from wood you know can you use our system for that uh, our our comment always is customers do it we know of customers that have used our systems for methane uh, in jungles and all kinds of places uh, they've captured gases from from cows and barns and done things with it. If you can get the BTU content and pressure within, you know, no more than two psi, uh, but no lower than eh, sixty eight six to eight inches water column, chances are it's going to run. Because this, like I said, this ran this this regulator will run a, a thousand. Uh, watt generator it'll also run a 30 kW generator so one 30 30 times the size so there's such a large swing in what it can do but it takes someone who cares enough to try it to do it so uh, 
I think that was a long way of answering a short question again. I have a tendency to do that. <laughs> Sorry, we got another question here. Uh, this is from Donald over on YouTube. Donald just uh, starts with a comment. He's been using the motor snorkel for a couple years now. How long before there is deterioration of the rubber or should it or how long before there is a deterioration of the rubber and or should it be replaced? Well, motor snorkels have a lifetime guarantee because the rubber that we use, we call it the probe. Uh, and the probe, this is, this is the probe right there. The, the piece that sticks in, it probes into the carburetor or the, it's really the snorkel. That is a space age rubber we have soaked it forever in gasoline. Uh, we have crushed it forever and come back and left it sit for a while and it's back to normal. It's just a, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, technology has brought about and, and it's fabulous. So to answer your question, the, uh, the, the Buna rubber itself that the gasket's made of, it could, def um, deflect uh, you could pull it off and it can look like look terrible but what it's doing it's contouring to the carburetor so it's actually you know finding a comfortable spot to live on your carburetor it doesn't matter what it looks like it that's one thing about these they're, they're just they are an industrial product they're not meant to be in your living room on your shelf you stick them in your uh, air filter, air stream, and you're done with them. So to answer your question, there's no maintenance. There's nothing to do to it, nothing to clean, nothing to worry about. Uh, they're impervious to gasoline. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Now, we do provide, sometimes if they look nasty enough from, from production, because uh, production... Uh, you'll have issues with production sometimes. We'll we'll over spray them with a with a, a a rubber spray, and that that can peel off. But again, that we just don't want customers to pull it out of the box and go, "Boy, that's an ugly looking thing," because this is one of those cases. Looks don't matter. You know, it's it's what it does, and that's what people buy this product for. Is what it does. It makes their engine run on propane and natural gas. Once it's installed, you can't even see it. All you can see is just a skinch of the edge of it. So, uh, so sometimes we try to make them look nicer if they look a little ratty. But uh, by and large, uh, we don't spray them. But uh, so no, there's no maintenance whatsoever. It needs to be done. But if you ever have an issue with them, we're, we stand behind them because they're well built. This is another follow-up from the guy that was asking about uh, installing motor snorkel on his dual-fuel OEM mm -hmm. generator. He just wanted to clarify that a motor snorkel was required, and uh, I did answer the question that, yes, you would have to have a motor snorkel still to do that. You couldn't just connect natural gas to the, to the existing uh, connections there that came to the generator. Sorry. No, it doesn't work that way. That, they would advertise that. They'd brag about that, wouldn't they? <laughs> Yeah, it's just uh, uh, we're our our goal one day is that all all machines will come snorkel prepped. So you open your box, you know, instead of a paper gasket being on your carburetor, you'll have a snorkel with a cap on it, and you just hook your regulator up if you need it. Okay, here's another question. This is coming from David. David says, I have had my regulator that I got from you all in 2004. How long will that last in storage? Will the rubber gasket diaphragm hold up? All right, actually, that's, um, that's, a, that's a, a special type of silicone uh, gasket material. Uh, we used a regulator the other day that we've had for 20 years and it ran perfectly so you should go at least 20 years without even have to think about it uh, those are very well that that, that material has been around you gotta remember this carburation technology has been around for 60 70 years when it, uh, 
they used to use hydrine, which is a black type of uh, flexible material, and it would stiffen in the winter. But these, this new material that's used in the regulators, uh, as you can see here, it's a it's a special silicone type, very very flexible. I mean, it's um, very soft, pliable, and it stays that way for a long time. Uh, the only thing that can ever happen with these to think if you want to think about is uh, if they sit for a long time what can happen is because the spring let me get the other one all right so you have the spring pushing this spring here is the atmospheric spring and it's pushing against the lever and see that and it's cantilevered to where it, or not cantilevered uh, the fulcrum right here pushes the seat orifice against seat against the orifice see that rubber seat it's hard to see on the camera but uh, so let's go back the spring is constantly pushing the lever against the fulcrum which pushes the the seat against the orifice now if you don't operate the unit for quite some time there's not going to be any movement like this from you know the engine running because actually when this thing is running, it's, it's more like this. These things do like that. They pulse. So now you have the spring constantly pushing. What can happen is the diaphragm goes to travel inward and the rubber will stick to the seat right there on the orifice. So best thing to do is if before you hook up your hose, uh, I always suggest before you hook up your hose, first, maybe it's been disconnected for a while. You should always have it capped, of course. You know, some kind of cap, keep bugs out of it. Same is true for the vent holes on the side because these vent holes will allow a, a critter to crawl up on the, whoop, on the back side here. You can have a whole nest of creatures in there like ants burying their dead loved ones. So, point I was making is, let's say you have your little cap here, you take your cap off, you're gonna hook up your hose. First thing you wanna do is take something like a, this pin and just push that in, see that? and make sure it's not stuck to the orifice because it can do that. And what I have done on some is I've taken a Q-tip, uh, not a Q-tip, a, a foam tip. You don't want a Q-tip because it, uh, it can shred on you with little strings, but they make those little foamy type tips. Just any kind of lubricant, WD-40 something, just put around in there uh, and it should keep it from sticking. But other than that, you shouldn't have to worry about it. That's what's great. It won't gum up. <laughs> Nothing like that. All right, another question from YouTube. This is from Will. Will says he has a Honda EU3000 that he installed motor snorkel on. With two questions. Does the gasket between the air cleaner and carb need to be removed? I'm assuming he's talking about the OEM gasket. Let's just take that one to start. No. It does not have to be removed. The metal ones, I would, if they're made out of metal with the rubber in, inside. Uh, but they don't have to be, no. Um, if uh, It's best to go ahead and leave the OEM gasket at the carburetor and then add the snorkel. It doesn't hurt a bit, especially the very, very thin ones. Second part of the question is, is it common for the engine to lope at idle? Is it common for the engine? Yeah, what happens is uh, what you can do is on the carburetor, you will have, uh, do I have a carburetor? Yeah, okay. On the carburetor, uh, you'll have a, an idle speed screw. And here's a Honda copy. Let's see this black, let's see this black screw here. If I turn that inward, it's going to keep, well, I hope I can do this right see the throttle here's the throttle stop right here is the throttle stop so that it moves this way and that screw right here stops it now if I screw that in which it's hard to do with my fingers I don't have a screwdriver laying here that I can see anywhere but if you screw that in let me just show you see how the fly is closed way up if I screw that in 
which there's got to be a screwdriver around there somewhere. Hey, screwdriver. All right. Now, now I'm going to screw it in. Uh, I'm going to try to screw it in. It's amazing how tough that little screw is. All right. I'm screwing in extra just to show, but see now when I close the throttle all the way, see how you can see a little air gap around the edge? All right, so obviously it's going to be running faster at idle. So having said that, if you will just adjust that screw on yours just a little bit at a time, you should get that loping to go away. And the reason it's loping is that... Again, your negative signals in here, the chamber collapses, gas flows out of the orifice and out through to the carburetor. If there's not enough negative signal in here, this will try to, the, the lever will shut off. And then as it shuts off, the, uh, the machine opens up wants more airflow to try it because it's a governed engine. And so then it's sensed here and this opens up again, gas flows, then it starts to level out and tries to shut off again. So it's like, so it's doing this inside the regulator. Mm, mm, mm. And I can't do it very well. Mm. Anyway, if you'll adjust the idle mixture screw, see that's that zero governor is rated as a shutoff device, a safety shutoff. So it's trying to shut off the fuel. So that goes back to, I'm not a fan. Well, you have an inverter, so that's good. But uh, if it wasn't an inverter, uh, I'd be concerned. But it may be that your idle speed is just a little too low and you're not gonna save that much fuel anyway, being down uh, way low on your speed. So. Uh, go ahead, just give that idle mixture, idle speed, a little more, and you should be able to get that loping to quit. Okay, right now there are no more questions, so hey. we might want to start uh, wrapping it up. All right, we're wrapping up. What do we call that? Outro. So, uh, again, we're, we're very concerned with all our friends who've dealt with Harvey and Irma, and now uh, some effects of Maria, and of course the horrible effects down in Puerto Rico. Uh, do we want to say anything about shipping in there? We're having trouble right now getting product shipped in there, but um, we're, we're watching all the time to see if we can find um, whatever is available to, to get uh, packages moving into these affected areas. But uh, Let your friends know on YouTube and Facebook that we're here. Uh, I always wish we had something on there that would say, hey, have a show, because sometimes we can stop, drop, and do a show. Uh, today, we really had to pull some, some levers to have a show, but uh, we'd like to be able to answer questions if we can for our customers. So again, thank you for joining us for uh, US Carb Clinic with Dr. Hugh, and have a safe, pardon? Phone number. Oh, yeah, yeah. Our phone number, 1-800-553-5608. He's so good at that now. Uh, you can call. I always forget that. Call. You can email. Uh, live chat with our personnel. Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. Boy, we get a lot of Facebook. And so uh, thank you for sharing us with your friends. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to know that we can be helpful. So we hope you have a, a wonderful and safe evening. <laughs>